I am Jim or James Donchi, and my day job is directing something called the Johnson Center for Environmental Innovation at Gustavus Adolphus College in St. Peter. Um, I also do some solar thermal installation on the side, and I'm a board member of the Minnesota Renewable Energy Society, which um, about a year or a little bit more ago got a, um, some support from the state Division of Energy Resources to do a guide to renewable energy for schools and institutions uh, about how to get projects going. And I helped write that. I was certainly not the principal author, but I did a piece of it. And then uh, we then are work now are working with the Southwest CERTs, or Clean Energy Resource Teams um, organization, which has, um, I guess, outreach from the University of Minnesota, but um, other sources of funding. And in this area, it's the Southwest CERTs, which is represented by Nettie Baird. And um, they have asked us to reach out to this region with that guide, which you'll get a copy of when Laura Cena arrives. Laura Cena is the managing director of the Minnesota Renewable Energy Society. Sort of keeps things going and coordinating and working through things. And I'm sure she's regretting being late, but there was a map miscalculation. She's of, within a minute away. Probably. Yeah, map miscalculation. And fortunately, I was uh, ready and raring to go today and got here early, so we're set. So what I decided to do is not do a PowerPoint with words. My PowerPoint only has pictures. You have in front of you the notes that I'm going to try and follow, and you'll find that there is considerable amount of space in that document. And that's intentional because if you want to take notes, write down a question, um, you're welcome to, to, to you know, use it that way. Um, you'll also get the guide, which is another thing you'll have. And I've also included a list of some projects we've done at Gustavus. And I include them because they represent you know, a kind of effort that you might see in an institution and, and have e example power. Um, I'm also going to, when we're done here, I won't dig around now, I have a stack of my business cards so you can, um, as a part of this effort, I'll be available as a resource. And um, highly likely, if you come and ask me a question, my first instinct will be to direct you to someone else because I'm not the expert. I think I know something, but other people will know something and, and the best thing is to connect you with the right person. But I'll do my best to make that connection or if I can do it myself, give you some help. Uh, to help guide, guide the projects. Um, I, I've given you a little bit of my background, but I'll just say that I've been, had an interest in solar technology for many years, but it wasn't until about 2006 that I could have gotten my boots on the roof, quite literally. I was living in Kentucky at the time and been learning about solar thermal technology and said, let's do it. And this was putting the panels up on the roof. Not an OSHA-approved approach, but um, the result worked out quite nicely. I'm learning how to do the smart board thing. Um, not everything you there needs to be there. I was also doing some research, so you actually see that's a weather station. <laughs> I was trying to get some data and collect and prove that this thing worked. And this thing was a bit unique in that it's a drain back system. In solar thermal, that's one way to freeze protect them as you allow the water to drain back into the house when it's cold, when the pump shuts off. And that's a pretty common approach, but usually they don't power it with photovoltaics. And I was able to power it with photovoltaics and demonstrate that that worked. And it was unique enough that I actually wrote, um, got to learn how to use these boards. You can click the next arrow right there if you want to. Yeah. Um, this was a diagram. I did an article in, in a magazine called Home Power about that system. And then went on, and I've done, depending on how you count them, five or six solar thermal systems. Now most of them, that was the only one in Kentucky. I finished that system and found out I needed to move for family reasons. And so shifted to here. And these are just some shots from the adventures of working. Um, this is after being in an attic on an 80 to 90 degree day with cellulose insulation. Not recommended. Um, and working, and this, these are my, my son and his cousin. After helping me for a day, they were messing around with their hair and came up with some fun stuff. So, um, and um, 
this is just another example of, of some of the work. This is actually in, in New Ulm. Um, but, and, and ultimately this led, I'm now a NABSEP, North American Board of Certified Energy Practitioners, solar heating installer. It means I took the test and passed. Whew. Made it. Um, so now I want to broaden the conversation and talk about clean energy in general. I've just been mentioning solar thermal as a way to give you some sense of my background. Uh, these are, this is a picture of a project that save us, I'll talk about in a bit. The goal here is to talk about clean energy. And, and talking about that, I'm going to mention something that I'm not going to talk much about, but it's an equally important part of, of the project, which is one of, one of the aspects of getting clean or cleaner energy is conservation and efficiency. And I say both of those, conservation and efficiency, because conservation is using less, efficiency is doing more with the same amount, and sometimes they don't always work together to reduce your load. You can increase your efficiency and then you relax and, and use more. Um, because you can get more for the same money. Um, so I see the two as being different but working together for the same goal. So what, what kind of renewables are we talking about? And catch me if I miss something, but I think I've kind of got an inclusive look of what's possible in, in our climate, our region. We've got wind electric, which is something um, that I've got one out of order that we um, know a lot about in this area, both large and small scale. Since you in this southwest Minnesota have seen the large a lot, I put the other end of the spectrum. This is a uh, 2.4 kilowatt Skystream turbine that we put up at Gustavus under a grant for demonstration purposes. It's been operating 10 months now. and. Working, working quite well. Um, I just now have some students trying to compare the wind data that we have with the output to get an idea of if it's performing up to, up to snuff or not. There is certainly, here are a couple examples of solar electric. This is a uh, solar electric system going on a dental clinic in St. Peter, done by an installer who happens to be another board member for MRES. Um, that's a typical kind of rooftop system. In a commercial <coughs> setting, you sometimes are seeing this in Minnesota. This is a 10K solar system. The backside of these as a reflector to reflect more sunlight onto the panels. And it works well. This is a ballast mounted system. Very common option for commercial buildings. You don't have to put any holes through your roof to do this. It's set on the roof and weighted down with concrete blocks. And, um, Roofers like that, not having any holes in there. Wind turbine we'd already seen. And I just want to mention that this is a, a real option in our, our area, some kind of biomass, which we usually think of burning something. And I happen to have a picture of corn stoves. Um, given what's happened with drought and prices, I don't think many people will be burning corn this winter. But the same technology works really well with wood pellets, which can be made from wood, scrap wood. and you can find now, it's happening in the northeast of the United States, but it's really well developed in Sweden. You can have a pellet burning furnace in your house and a truck will back up and fill your bin with wood pellets and runs your furnace automatically at very little maintenance. Uh, so that is a, is a very real option uh, for, for heating applications in particular. But I should also mention that biomass also includes anaerobic digestion which is happening in our area, particularly with large livestock operations. About three or four miles to the southwest of St. Peter is Northern Plains Dairy, which that facility has about 3,000 cows. It's running an anaerobic digester, treating its waste successfully, recovering the fiber from the waste for bedding, and making electricity. And apparently now that they changed the controls, they think it's working quite well. A couple years ago, they did, said it wasn't worth the trouble, and then they changed the controls, and now they're happy as clams. So. Um, I also mention here, which we don't have much, many options with this, is hydropower. If you did happen to be in a location with a stream with steady flow and sufficient drop, you could do small-scale hydropower. 
Um, falling water, just not something we're seeing here in southwest Minnesota very much. And um, tidal and wave power, again, we're a long ways from the ocean, but just for completion, I, I mentioned those as renewable sources. Did I miss anything that's on your minds? I just, yeah, go on, okay. Um, the first step in anything is to think about motivations. And we tend to sometimes pigeonhole renewable energy, oh, it's an environmental thing, or I'm gonna save money. But I, in preparing this talk, I just sort of went through, yes, there is the clean energy uh, for environmental, and including the climate issue. Um, there's an energy security issue. If you have control over the energy supply and how it's delivered, um, in a global situation where oil is coming from conflict areas and in a, a business climate where businesses come and go, that energy security is important. It's economic development. Uh, if you want to do something interesting, take a look at your region's expenditures, your region's economy, and take a look at what's spent on energy. I, I was part of a group, Region 9 Economic Development, a separated sort of circling Mankato, uh, nine county area. Um, it's a phenomenal amount of money that when you look at it that by and large leaves the region. If you can find a way using renewable energy to keep that money at home, it helps your economic development. Um, educational, um, if we think that our future is gonna have renewable energy in it, we'd sure like our children and our college students to understand it so that they can be a part of that economy. And, and certainly for, for those of you part of schools, that, that can be a pretty strong motivation. Certainly cost savings and risk reduction, that's kind of a security thing, but the cost, locking in, renewable energy tends to lock in your energy source. You, you lock into the sun for 20 years and the cost of sun will not go up. The cost of fuel will go up, but the cost of the sun will not go up. Um, the uh, one other one I put on there is clean energy is cool. It is just really fun as, as an intellectual and as a, as a cultural thing to think about the fact that this is something we can capture and use. And, and I also say that there's a, there's a motivation that's related to all of these, which is, I say, getting, getting rid of false choices. We have this frame that says, we must, to, to get the things we need, heat our houses, get our lights working, operate our equipment, we must damage the environment somewhere, or we must cause a problem somewhere else. And the premise of clean energy is we can reduce that false choice to say to get what we need, we have to wreck something else. We don't necessarily have to do that. We can, we can do a better job of that. Um, I can't resist. There's an energy think tank in Colorado that um, generated this little, little ditty, but it goes like this. Um, and it's about thinking carefully about what we want. We don't want refrigerators and shower and, and hot water heaters. I mean, if you wake up in the morning, you're not worried about, a ref do I have a refrigerator? Do I have a hot water heater? What you really want is cold beer and warm showers, right? You want what those things provide. You want the service. And if, if it can be provided some other way, we'll, we'll take it. If we can have a warm shower, it, it's, it's less of a concern to us how it happens as that it happens. And if, if you want refrigeration, how it happens. So this motivation section is really about thinking carefully about why you want to do a renewable energy project and think about it. And I'm going to stop there and, and just say, you know, you got up somewhat early on a Saturday morning to come here and listen to me which is, as my children will tell you, not the most exciting thing in the world. Um, <clears throat> what, what brings you to the table? Any one thing specific, or just I should learn about this? Just to learn. To learn? I'd like to see our kids, i like to incorporate in our school okay. so that our kids can work with it. Okay. See it, see it happening. All right. Um, <clears throat> can I jump in? Yeah. Hi. This is Laura Cena. I'm Laura. I'm sorry I'm late. I have false information. I told them all <laughs> kinds of stories about you. <laughs> I have false information. So, I have printed copies of the Renewable Energy Guide for Schools, which is applicable to any 
public institution, I suppose, or mm -hmm. business or farm. So does anybody want one? Or you can download you. it on the internet. Yeah. I've already promised them they'd get one. So. Okay, well, you definitely get one for coming yeah. this early. And my, my talk is somewhat, a lot of this is actually based on the outline of what's in there. I don't necessarily duplicate what's, what's going on in there. It's, it's a pretty rich document. Um, the, the, it was really interesting to work with the people who helped put this together. It really drew on many years of experience in permitting and in getting projects done. Um, really nice to see it come together. Can, so, can I answer your question too? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. got distracted. But uh, no, I'm, I, I'm, I teach a quarter to all, all middle school students, a bunch of seventh graders on green energy and the environment, but I would love to get a, um, some sort of like, like our, our schools in a district in Montevideo to be self sustaining, um, mm -hmm. so whether it be green energy mm -hmm. or something else, I don't want to, I'd like to get something off. So okay. Well, that's, what we're going to go through here is sort of the steps, how to get there, is my next bullet point. And I'd like to um, sort of go through that, illustrating it with a few pictures. And the first thing that came up in the outline of the book is understanding opportunities and, and limitations. And, <clears throat> you know, limitations can be the physical. You know, this house has 80-foot cottonwoods along the south side. And especially in southwest Minnesota where trees are a little scarce, but in general, trees provide so many benefits that you've got to have a pretty good reason for cutting a tree down. So, you know, with 80-foot cottonwoods on the south side, a rooftop solar array is just not going to work there. You're going to have to put it somewhere else or uh, approach another, another source. Or like when I lived in Kentucky, uh, unless I happened to be on a mountain ridge top, a wind turbine just was not a sensible idea. They have these, this wind rating class of wind starting with zero with no wind and going up. We were a zero. You know, the wind blew so infrequently that when we did have a storm, the power automatically went out because the trees hadn't been stressed and somewhere a tree would fall on a power line. Just didn't take much wind. Uh, so, but you also need to recognize that you have a lot of opportunities. You use energy in many different ways. And, and there are ways to put together a project that may work financially and ed educationally. So with that background, the first step is evaluating your site and your resource. And <clears throat> the site is not just, you know, do I have shade, do I have wind, do I have a place to put this, but it also has what is the renewable energy system integrating with or fitting with. And I include this picture. This is a solar thermal array on our campus providing part of the hot water for our dining service operation. Uh, now, that was a dynamite application because our cafeteria runs almost uh, year-round. We have two or three weeks of, of downtime during the year. And in fact, that was one of the limitations because these, uh, this array is sitting right over top of the serving area. And that's a rather unique solar thermal array, and that, that is ballast mount. That's not often done. And that was done because to do the proper thing, put in penetrations through the roof and mount it directly to the roof, we'd have had to have been in the serving area with ladders and welders. And we didn't have a lot of opportunity to do that. And so there was a high motivation, can we get this done without disrupting the food service operation? And we did it. Another this was really nice because that year-round load is, is a very efficient one for solar thermal. But we had another problem, is we didn't have any water meter on just on the cafeteria. We didn't have any way of measuring. It was coming from our steam plant. We didn't have any way of measuring what our load was. So we had to do some indirect kinds of things. Well, how many people are we serving? And what's the national standard for how much hot water you need in a cafeteria? And, oh, we do know how much water this building uses, and there's not much else going on, so probably the water is all going to the cafeteria, and then how much of that is hot water. So we had to do some guessing by golly to figure it out. Um, so that's the kind of understanding your site is, is what's your physical structure. Quite often roof issues are an issue. What load are you connecting to? How does it match with that? What are, what are unique things about your site? Another thing to think about very carefully for an educational institution is how you want to integrate that, that learning in there. And um, 
I'll, I've got a couple more. Um, just making sure that I go through here. Um, make sure that I'm following my notes. I was starting to, to diverge a little bit. How to work with it. This represents, for a solar, one of the, one of the steps. It's, a, it's the printout or the physical manifestation of something called a solar pathfinder analysis, which is a little device. Um, it's actually a very simple, non-electronic device. You can take a picture and do it digitally, but of making a one-time stop to a location and knowing when throughout the year it's going to be shaded. So I can go once to a location, put this pathfinder down, take a picture, put the picture into a computer analysis, and essentially what you have here is each one of these lines represents a month of the year, and these are times of the day, and anything that's above here is shaded, so I now know that in December from about 10, or actually better to say 11 to 3, back up, I'm unshaded in, in December, which is your low sun angle month. Whereas way back here in July, June and July, I'm unshaded most of the year. I now have a way to measure the solar radiation. So that's one of the things you, you want in thinking about a solar site solar project is to know what your shading is. Um, this is actually not too bad. You're losing a little bit in December, but the reality is, particularly for something like solar thermal or solar electric, you really are wanting this 9 to 3 or 10 to 2 window to be unshaded. So we got some potential with this site. I can't even remember for sure which site it was. I just Maybe if I looked at that picture carefully, I could figure it out. Um, Likewise, if you've got a wind site, you're worried about how much wind you have, and you can get wind maps for that. Um, I think that's my next picture. Um, we have some really nice tools. I can now, using Google Earth, give someone a fairly quick guess, guesstimate, early guesstimate of whether they got a potential for renewable energy by looking at the aerial photographs in Google Earth. In some cases, the resolution is extremely high. I can tell you within probably six inches to a foot the size of the solar array on my roof by looking on Google Earth. Um, it's, it's pretty good. And for wind, um, we have accessible state wind maps. So I have the latitude and longitude of a location near St. Peter. And this little number down here gives me an estimate of the wind speed, average annual wind speed at 30 meters about 100 feet off the ground, and I can use that. So we can, we can work on the limitations. And to, to talk about limitations and, and what's going on, um, for each technology, there, there's a different set of criteria. For wind, for example, um, you really want to be able to get at least the bottom of your rotor to be at least 30 feet above any obstruction within 500 feet. Just a good rule of thumb for how a wind project works. So right away you can look at your site and say, can I do that? And obviously you have some play. Um, if I can get a taller tower, I can work with trees. But of course that adds an expense. And if I, or if, if I can go out that way in the direction of the prevailing wind and get myself upwind from an obstruction, maybe I can work with a site. Things you can, you can play around with. Um, just thinking about my notes and trying to be careful here. I, I talk about limitations a bit, and I've talked about the resource. Um, quite often in a facility, you run into zoning issues. So you, you've got to understand those limitations. Um, we've had a long-standing desire to do a, a utility-scale wind turbine at Gustavus, and we ended up being blocked by a county ordinance that said, um, half mile setback from an occupied dwelling. And um, that just about eliminated most locations in the county. And, and so you need to know those limitations. On the other hand, our little turbine fell within a city zoning ordinance that said um, if it's less than 50 feet tall, all you need to do is ask for a building permit. And it's got to fall on your, it's got to be able to fall on your lot too, which is a college campus, we have a big enough lot 
that it would fall on, on campus. But uh, so different different rules. Obviously, there are knowledge limitations. I've talked about how much energy do we use. Cost limitations. You've got your payback. Um, a vision limitation is quite often. Quite often, people say, "Oh, I can't do solar." Uh, we just were having a conversation before. Um, the gentleman here has a solar thermal air heating panel on his house that's reducing his utility bill. His neighbor basically told him it wouldn't work before he even built it. That's a vision limitation. That's just, you know, people can't see, don't have enough examples of, of what's going on. And sometimes in an institutional setting where you have multiple stakeholders, that becomes your biggest obstacle. It's just getting enough people that believe that it can be done. And, and so it, it takes some work to get that together. Um, and so your motives need to be all thought about in terms of the context. And then you go into evaluating all these things I'm talking about. Your energy resource, in terms of the renewable resource, your energy use, your existing equipment, your existing building. And that all boils down to one of the, the recommendations of the guide and many other people in, in this business, which is, if at all possible, once you have some idea of where you're going, get someone in who can give you an independent site assessment relative to what, what you think your plans are. It's likely to cost you something. I put on here a $200 to $600 cost. I, I think the low end of that is pretty accurate. I'm not sure it has to go as high as 600 but if you, can, if you can at all possible do that, get someone who's not selling a particular piece of equipment, or if they do, they're willing to excuse themselves from selling to you and recommend. And even better, someone who has broad knowledge so they can say, yeah, you called me here to do a site assessment for photovoltaic system, but you know, you have a really good opportunity in solar thermal or wind, you should think about that. Someone who's not got the blinders on to say, you talked about an air conditioner, you talked about geothermal, we're going to talk about geothermal and nothing else. Because there are often opportunities that you don't realize and, and by, in, by having someone who, who knows the industry can look broadly, can sort of give you some guidance and say, yeah, there's something better you can do here. Or you have some choices, you have some really good choices. Um, <coughs> Well, that's, that's a good segue into, into how, do, how do you find someone like that. Um, MRES has some limited capacity to direct you to people. The eastern part of the state's been a little bit easier because Wisconsin has been running an educational program to train independent site assessors in wind and solar. Um, yeah, we have some in St. Cloud. Um, yeah. And you know, just by asking around, I can kind of yeah. find them. And I can go a little bit out on a limb and say that if, particularly for wind and solar, if you're really stuck, I can give you a hand. I, I have an yeah, outreach, com outreach component to, to my job that lets me sort of do some of this stuff. And um, I, I, especially I can have the initial conversation. The fallback is you can work with an installer. There are reputable installers that will give you a straight story before they give you the, the, the sales pitch. Um, and quite often what they'll do is they'll give you a site assessment and say it's free if you buy from me, which already right away biases things, but we have some mechanisms in the industry to sort of push for straight shooters. That NABCEP certification that I mentioned is also applies to solar uh, photovoltaic installers. There's a, a rating for that and there's also one for now for small wind coming in and the testing procedure for that really does emphasize them giving good, solid advice and, and sound technical analysis when they do a site assessment. They, they bring that in. So that's, a, that's one measure of where you can do. And then there's all, all the usual things you do in any capital project, you know. Oh, you want to sell me a piece of equipment? Give me some references. Let me talk to some happy customers. And, and usually, um, if nobody has a happy customer, that's a, that's a signal, and you know, obviously they'll cherry pick, but then when you talk to the customer, they, you can say, who else did you consider for this job? And you can start branching out and getting. We have some resources. The end of my, um, my outline here gives you the CERTS website. They have some resources 
for finding people that are installers. We have some at MRES. I give you the link also to um, the Division of Energy Resources at the State Commerce Department, which has some good resources. And for rural areas, particularly for agriculture, I also mentioned the Minnesota Project, which has had a farm rural energy outreach, and their website has, has resources. And so um, those are, think, I think, probably for southwest Minnesota, the best starting places for, for finding out. No, I don't, but I should. It's the Midwest Renewable Energy Association, which is based in Wisconsin. So that's in the guy. That's in the guy. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the next step is the thinking about that curriculum piece. And as far as the learning goes, you can start a renewable energy pro planning process. And at the end of the process, you can come to the conclusion that you're not going to build anything. And you will still have had a successful learning opportunity for your school. If you are willing and can involve your students in the process right from the beginning. Um, that's more on what you ha would happen in a wind site assessment. I kind of skipped over that, but that's the kind of thing you might look, look for in an analysis from an independent assessor. This is something that was developed with Windistry. It let, takes four different turbines, your wind regime, your location, and says, what might the economics be for, for that situation? That's the kind of thing you might look for in a site assessment. But I, I show this. This is a screenshot of a website that's still up, up at Gustavus. In our turbine project, a couple faculty, driven by some students, and it was student-driven at the start, did all the monitoring and analysis that might go into, our, that, might have, that would, would support our turbine project. That became a learning endeavor. We got stalled on the big turbine project, but along the way, the students learned an awful lot. And we st we're still using that. We, st we have some lab laboratory exercises that we use for analyzing wind power that come right out of that experience that, that's, you know, we got benefit from the project even though we didn't get the big turbine up. And maybe someday we'll still figure it out. Nobody, we aren't giving up. So recognize that, that the learning is, as I say in my, it's a before, during, and after project. Before the planning process, during, how do we get this project up, and afterwards, monitoring. I just, before we were waiting at the start here, logged into one of our, sol the, actually the solar thermal system I was showing you on the cafeteria roof. I get a daily email at 12.01 a.m. of the data from that system for the day. I don't look at it every day. I got more, better things to do. But a few weeks ago, there was a need for a student project in a class, and I piled six months of those files together in one big Excel file and handed it to some students, and they are calculating the energy production from that system. Um, and, and in the ideal world, and, and you can talk usually for wind and solar electric, this is quite easy to build in. You can build in web-based monitoring where people can look up the production and do that kind of analysis. Um, it's, it's a really good idea. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing is making your project visible as much as possible. We're, we still don't have that much renewable energy. Wind is pretty visible, but, but there's, there's a real need for projects that stand out for people to do their learning. So that's a community education. And it's not just for kids in schools. Our communities need to learn about this. Your zoning officials need to have some understanding. They generally want to know, but since they work in a legal environment, they're a little scared, so they're a little cautious. And there are resources out there for zoning officials to learn. I, I work, worked with someone at the Economic Development Agency that now just took a job in zoning in Nicollet County. And a week after, on, on week he was on the job, first week, he sends me a sample solar ordinance. He said, is this, is this the best thing that's out there? because they like to have the samples. So by doing your project, you're likely to influence your zoning officials, because they have to learn. You're likely to influence local um, electricians and plumbers, because they would be curious about the project. They might be asked to be a subcontractor, and they have a bunch of learning to do. So think broadly in terms of education. Now, to the tough one. 
your schools. And of course, as we all know, the legislature has just been pouring money into you, right? You've been getting tons of money, right? And, and your taxpayers are just jumping up and down to raise the property tax levy, right? Mm, wrong. Um, financial stuff is tough. I can't give you all the answers, but I'm going to help you try and think about this. And I turn to... Um, that's a, a visibility. I'm falling behind on my pictures here. I'm sorry about that. Um, that's our little turbine. We're actually able to make the data available on the web. It's not working perfectly yet, but we're getting better at getting that display. Okay, I wanna, want you to think about finances and uh, ask you to do a, an exercise. What's the first question that someone usually asks you about in terms of renewable energy and costs? What's, what's How much is it going to cost and what's the payback? What's the payback? All right. All of you own a car, right? When you went to buy a car, did you ask a payback question? Probably not. Did you ask for payback on your house? Well, maybe you were hoping it would increase in value, but um, you needed a house, right? You needed a car. Well, energy is the kind of same way. So you can talk payback, and actually, if I'm talking wind, if you can get your turbine size up into the 30 to 40 kilowatts, you are talking payback. This system will pay for itself in a short period of time. If you're talking solar, no. But for the next 10, 20, 30 years, however long you hope to be on this, however long you hope your institution is going to be around, you are going to be paying an energy bill. Who to might change. What the fuel source is might change. You're going to be paying an energy bill. So the really important question is to look at what you're paying now and what you'll pay in the future and ask whether we can somehow manage this renewable energy project to not too much exceed that or perhaps in the future be less than. And I, I took a, a little snapshot from a spreadsheet I, I use to analyze photovoltaic projects. And this is the, the tough nut. Smart boards here. Um, total system cost is pretty scary. This is probably for a 5 kW system, which would be appropriate for residents. A $20,000 expense is nasty. Now, it probably actually works out pretty well if you're building a new house and you can roll it into your, your loan. And you will probably hardly will even notice that it's there and everything will be fine. But if you're in a school institution, a $20,000 expenditure is a $20,000 expenditure and it will probably be taking place at the board level and will be looked at deeply. So if I look at that, it's a 27 year to break even and in 20 years, it's, you're paying 19 cents a kilowatt hour, which is more than what you're paying now for your electricity. But if I'm moving out to the 13, to the 30 year, I'm now down at 13 cents. And I believe this is with the tax credit. I forgot to check on this spreadsheet. But that's that's another, another piece of this, our, our incentives. All right, at 13 cents, do you really think you're only going to be paying 13 cents a kilowatt hour in 30 years? You're going to be paying more. So this is now looking like a hedge against inflation. So the really tough nut is to figure out a way to manage this big upfront cost in a way that looks more like what you're paying for in your utility bill. And so what I'm suggesting that we need to think about is um, ways to spread this out. And obviously, as school districts, if it's a big project, if you can roll it into bonding somehow, that's a way to finance in the long term. Um, there are also some creative things, and this will depend on your context, but particular for solar wind and solar phot photovoltaic, Minnesota has been the lead in something called the FLIP model. In fact, Jewel Wind, which we will be visiting in Pipestone. I'm sorry, you guys can't visit there. Uh, can. They can. Can't. They could come. They could come. Um, I'm just thinking it's too far. Um, it was a pioneer in this. This is an IRS blessed, that is in the Internal Revenue Service says this is okay. If you have in your community a business person with some capital capacity and something, that this, I love this phrase, tax appetite, as in they're paying taxes. There is a structure whereby 
they can invest in your system, you end up paying them for the electricity for a while, you're still, you're, you know, it's electricity you're paying for anyway, you pay them for it at, at something like your utility rate, they, love this terminology, harvest the tax credit and the depreciation, and then when they're done, they can lease the system to you or sell it to you at a lower cost. And in that partnership, and, and I was actually, I had a call from a person who does project development the other day saying, I have some investors who would like to do this with Gustavus. They want to do a really big project. And it's dependent on some legal stuff or some legislation relating to a grant. But it's also available out there for smaller projects. You can put something together especially if you have an educational purpose in your community that works. That's one mechanism that's out there. And it doesn't have to be a local person. No, it doesn't it's have to be is. local. I, I like the idea of it being a local person because usually your business people, your, your local people have some investment in education, some psychological investment, and they'd like to be involved, and I think that's better. But it can be someone heaven forbid, even from out of state, and usually your project developer, developer will help you put that relationship together. The legal work is now, it still costs some for legal work, but it's, it's kind of packaged now. There are people that know how to do this to, to make it work. And if you're a school district that wants to do a, a somewhat large demonstration photovoltaic project or a wind project, I think that's a really good possibility for making it happen. Um, there are also out there um, the idea of any energy service contracting. Um, President Clinton has been big on this with large educational institutions to essentially pair up some financing with energy services companies. And the deal there is we'll come in and we'll make a change and we'll share the savings with you and you don't pay anything, which it really works well for institutions that don't have fundraising unlimited fundraising capacity. Usually the, this is for projects that if you do have the ability to raise the money, forget the other company, you do it yourself. But if you can't raise the money, this is a way to get financing in a low risk. Particularly good for energy conservation, but for some of the renewable energy projects it probably has some validity. And I'll, I'll give you the energy conservation example where this is most often used. I can show you straight up bare knuckle financing that lighting changes like compact fluorescent bulbs have a payback of about 100%. That is, the rate of return based on how businesses do it is 100% per year, which is phenomenal. Um, if, I, if I have a compact fluorescent light bulb, I replace an incandescent bulb, even allowing for it needing to be replaced every few years, my rate of return can be well over 100%. All right. Now you've got a large building, you've got a gymnasium, that's a big project. That's tens of thousands of dollars and getting the money out of the school board and out of the taxpayers is hard. But you can do an ESCO kind of arrangement where somebody will come in, replace the lights for you, and split the savings with you. And, you know, they'll... And describe again, ESCO means? Energy Services Contracting Organization. I did, I did, I was careless with that. Thank you for catching that. Um, so those, those are possibilities that are out there. I don't, I don't know how much it's, it's reached into smaller school districts, but it's certainly large institutions. I, I'm approached at Gustavus by energy service contracting type people all the time. Um, City of Brooklyn Park a few years ago did a major rework of their community center, which included the um, hockey rinks in Brooklyn Park hockey. You can imagine what kind of level of facility this was. They worked with uh, an engineering firm doing a, essentially an ESCO type arrangement to get a geothermal operation in there and a very innovative thing that would take, you know, you've got hockey rinks and yet you also would have air conditioning. So they're taking excess heat or cold from one area and moving it to another part of the building and got some really nice, nice efficiencies out of the facility by doing that. And they financed it through that kind of an arrangement. Um, very unique. I think the uh, Department of Commerce also has some programs that, that work with the PV and gas for the, the ESCOs uh, type mm -hmm. of thing mm -hmm. that you're talking about. So right. there's some assistance through the Department of Commerce that units of government, school districts, 
Ten pages of it, yeah. And it's it's a little scary because they tend to be somewhat complicated arrangements. You got to spend some time sorting through the contractual arrangements, but they've been working for for years. They're, they've been around. They're, there's a pattern for for doing it, and you can get references. You can find out what's going on, and and define a contract that should be mutually beneficial for both parties. That's that's what you're really aiming for. Is a is a, a sharing of the savings, taking advantage of the energy services company financing capacity for your benefit. And I, would, I would recommend actually just about every school district take a look at this on the energy conservation side because it's particularly with older buildings and tight budgets, there, there are some real opportunities there. And, and if you think about it as we've got to pay for it, it ain't going to get done. But if you think about it as this is a way to leverage a partnership that gets us there, it's possible. Um, the final one I just want to mention for smaller projects with high educational value, you can quite often look to your community for donations and support. Um, I, you know, as an example, talk to your local electrician and say, hey, if you can support us in a small way, we'll make sure you have a seat at the table when, when the installation is going on so that you learn. Because most electricians do want to figure out what's going on in, in new areas. And this is a way you can get your, your hands on a project, um, learn from it, and benefit the school. Now, I've saved the, what's usually thought of as the major part of the project for last, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but it's bidding and managing the installation. And, and that, that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it is a statement I want to make, which is to say there is a lot going into managing a project in terms of the installation, a lot of technical stuff. But if you do all the stuff that I've just been talking about, that part gets easier, which is to say put your energy into planning and developing your project first, and then the implementation will generally go more easily. Um, it's like, usually like any construction project with an added piece of you're likely to be dealing with someone in there, either the installer, hopefully you'll have someone who has some experience, or the zoning person or your school board or somebody else who's not done this kind of project before and so it's, this isn't a road, this isn't a parking lot, there's some more learning that goes on and so that's the added piece which leads to my recommendation D which is it's a good idea, we do this with academic buildings at Gustavus, is you have someone who has connections with all these people serve as the project shepherd to help guide it through. They're not necessarily the person making all the decisions, but they're the person who connects the dots and say, oh, you're going to do that, we better talk to the janitor because that's going to affect their thing. Or you need to be introduced to our zoning official. He's really supportive, but he has some questions. Let's Let's go visit them and brings people together. Are, any, are you in a facilities role or are you a? I'm director of building grounds. So you, you know how this, this, this works. This is probably, I'm not probably telling you anything new, but it's about connecting, connecting the dots together. Um, some of the issues you deal with are, are, is it all one person doing everything from engineering or is it a large project where you've got project engineering, project management and construction, all different people. It's a general contractor and a subcontractor. And then how do you get those people to work? If, it's, if your renewable energy project is part of a larger construction project, that's especially something to pay attention to because your general contractor will say, oh yeah, you want to have solar panels and turn to a subcontractor. And sometimes you end up with a subcontractor who really didn't know anything about it. And you've got to step in there and, and say, let's make sure that this person has the, this firm, this person has the qualifications to do. do I, 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 in Kentucky, uh, we were doing a large environmental project, a, a student housing, married student housing project. And I really remember this. We, 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 we had a California architect and local construction firms, and we had some communication problems. And I remember being in this building, we were looking at a solar thermal installation, and this subcontractor was actually 
this plumber was pretty smart. He knew there was something wrong with how this, he'd been given a design and how it had been implemented. He didn't have the words, he didn't, but he knew that, that there was a problem and we had to sort of sit there with him a little bit and finally realize that a pump was not in the right place. It was, it was going to end up, pressure was going to drop. And, and so that's something that, you know, we'd gotten into a situation where if the subcontractors didn't have a lot of experience, but by having people on, on the job that knew what we were trying to do to deal with the communication, we could resolve the problem. Um, how to pick people, and I, I just, ideally you get multiple voices. For these solar projects that are on that sheet of projects from Gustavus that I put out, particularly for the photovoltaic and solar thermal projects, we actually, because it was a large enough project and, and had, had funding, we essentially put out an RFP, a request for proposals, and in a nice, warm, maybe about zero January day with a good stiff wind, we were up on seven or eight different roofs saying this is where it would be, you know, it, you, here are some possibilities for where you could put these projects, give us some proposals, and, and invited them to look. And that's, again, being farther out southwest Minnesota, it's going to be a little bit harder, but you do have some options. There are, I know of at least two uh, photovoltaic installers, um, one in Sleepy Eye, one in Springfield, um, that have the capacity to work on projects like this. You have some small wind installers, and, and again, the resources you have there. You have the ability to get a couple different bids on a project, which can be quite helpful for, for that learning process. Um, I have a note here, and I've talked about it before. Get your zoning people involved early. Sit down with them. They can help steer you away from a decision that will be just impossible zoning-wise. And they then have the time to do their homework, which they have to do. So they can go away and say, oh, they're going to come in with this project. I need to learn something. And then when, when the actual zoning application or permit application drops on their desk, they're not, oh, what do I do with this there? Oh, I'm ready for this. I'm, I'm go. And some things have happened to help. For anything involving electrical generation and an interconnection, and you can tell me if, if I'm right about this, but the state has required all utilities to create a document that tells you what the steps are you need to do to do your interconnection, to connect your system to the grid. And so fortunately for us with our little turbine projects and our solar projects, those rules were put in place just before we started. I had a document in front of me that told me the steps. It told me how much the utility could charge me for engineering. Um, and it told me what time frame they had to respond to me. And, and, and it just laid it out very clearly what needed to be done. And those, those kinds of things are helpful in the process. And I, I, most utilities now have it. They, most of the small utilities actually just took the state's template and duplicated it. So they all look kind of the same, but um, it's, it's workable. And the utilities are usually pretty good to work with. Yeah. You know, the, the, the landscape for electric is a little bit challenged because the co-ops in particular feel a bit threatened by it. And, and the threat, their feeling of that way is a little bit justified because they are totally dependent on their generating utility and they have high transmission costs because they have few customers, lots of lines. And, and there's still some, I think that you'll see in the next few years, some negotiations related to our state net metering law, the law that requires you, your utility to allow you as a small electrical generator to hook up your system to the grid. You, you know, under 40 kW, they have to let you on. Um, but we're going to see some adjustments, I think, to the law that deal with these issues for the co-ops. So the co-ops in particular are, are feeling, I would say, ambivalent when they deal with the project. But usually every utility has someone who knows what's going on or your installer will know how to work with them to do what the law, you know, the, what they're required to do by the law. And usually they'll go beyond even some of the co-ops go beyond what the law requires in, in helping you. It's, it's just they see the challenges to their business model and are wrestling with that. And then hopefully when you've gone all this, and I know I've not covered every possible thing, so we're going to do some Q&A now, um, you'll get to a point where you've got it working and you can just sort of celebrate and have the party in. 
have your, your system going and working. So, questions? I have yeah. Started. Um, I tend to understand that people seem to have long memories in mm -hmm. Southwest Minnesota. I'm an import here. I've only been here for like 27 years. Um, but in that time, um, as we've been looking at uh, more solar mm -hmm. for Southwest Minnesota, I have people come up to me pretty much with, you know, we tried to do that 20, 30 years ago, and it only worked for one or two years, and it doesn't work anymore. I go, well, the technology has improved significantly. How do we respond to people with those long memories? Because I'm sure this is going to be mm -hmm. something that will happen with other people, too. Here's what I think is behind that. The solar electric projects, which weren't many because the technology was really expensive and in its infancy, um, are actually probably have been pretty good unless there was some bad wiring, not the panels themselves. Some of the first generation, we were, we were lucky, the first generation of photovoltaic panels that went on the market came out of a development that was done for the space program. And when they're putting these things up on satellites and, and even human occupied missions, the engineering was a pretty high level. So you have some of those early panels that are still operating at a significant amount of, of their original capacity. There is some degradation over time, but they're pretty good. I mean, a couple of the first solar cells that Bell Labs made, they didn't even package them, still operate at 50% of their capacity. And they, they weren't even put in any kind of packaging. Where probably the problems came out is we had a solar water heating incentive program in the 70s, a tax credit program, and it it was, number one, probably a bit too generous, and number two, it didn't have any dial down over time as more installations, and it didn't have any quality control in it. And a lot, the solar thermal industry was really frustrated because a lot of junk went on the roofs. Some, and not all of it was junk. I rehabbed a system last winter in St. Peter that had gone in in that era, and it had had some work because the tornado had messed with it, but the original, um, pumping control unit was still in place and a controller had gone bad and I was able to get a repair, I was actually able to get it repaired which in electronics is unheard of or and I could find replacements and the pump that I had to replace was simple to replace. It was not, it, it had worked as intended but there were some that went in that were junk. They were, they were not built to last. What has happened in the meantime is that industry, even though it was in the wilderness because it, it dwindled, a few people stuck with the industry and they instituted something called the SRCC rating, I think it's the Solar Rating Certif and Certification Corporation. They instituted a third party panel certification program which I, I visited the, one of the facilities that does it in Florida. First thing they do is take your panel and set it out in tropical sun for 90 days. And then they cut it in half and look for corrosion and damage from the heat. And then they test its performance. They'll get it to a really hot temperature and spray cold water on it for thermal shock. And then give it a thumbs up or thumbs down. They shoot hail. Yeah, they, they, they do a hail testing. And so that industry in particular now you have on the products themselves, the, the physical hardware, a high degree of, of reliability. And, and so much so that you've been seeing, in some cases, panels that have been in use for 10, 20 years are going on the used market when somebody does a remodel or something. I was just mentioning because it's not something you just blow these people off. Right. We're saying because it's a legitimate concern. There, there were some part. serious quality issues at that time. And I just need to be able to have, and, and people need to be able yeah. to have a response, mm -hmm. uh, an intelligent response. Yeah, yeah I would say the industry is regulated now. It's okay. Tested. The, now, now it becomes it's more of, more of an issue. And, and I'll, I'll just say this outright. One of my installations, which was actually the same as what I did on my house, because of a design decision I made has been underperforming and I'm going back and fixing that because I, I now know what the issue, there, there was, there was the, the literature I had, this was a combined heating and hot water heating system, had two different recommendations about how to size the storage. I went the wrong way, but I didn't have 
a huge amount of data at the time to go on. And now that I now based on testing, I know. So now the problems will be on more complicated systems that are, are design decisions. The components themselves are very solid. It's it's design issues, but for what what were where the problems were occurring, basic solar hot water heating on a house. If you do your site assessment correctly, and have a a certified or someone who has training do the installation, you have a very solid system that you, you can be have a great deal of confidence in.